It's now time to start uh, our first session, which as Eric mentioned at the beginning is around customer experience. And this will be a discussion with Professor Dilip Soman. And this will be led by our colleague, Stefan Marcel, who is the chief growth officer at the BVA house here in the BVA family. And you'll see more of Stefan after this session as well. So stay tuned for our conversation with Professor Soman. Hi everyone, I am uh, honored to introduce our guest speaker for the customer experience session at the Human Advantage Conference. Stéphane Marcel, Chief Growth Officer at BVA Group and one of the group champions regarding customer experience and myself will be speaking with Professor Dilip Soman. Dilip is a world leader in behavioral science Currently, Canada Research Chair in Behavioral Science and Economics at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. He serves as the Director of the Behavioral Economics in Action Research Center, called BEAR, at Rotman. His research into behavioral economics has a particular focus on consumer well-being, marketing, and policy. Dilip is the author of a wonderful bestseller book, The Last Mile, published in 2015, I think. I have loved this uh, book. Uh, he also teach a massive open online course called BE101X, Behavioral Economics in Action, on EDX. Uh, I have followed. I think I was one of the first in 2013. So I am very uh, happy to be graduated from this uh, MOOC. Um, so a lot of things, but in the last two years, you have been very, very productive. You have edited two new books, The Behaviorally Informed Organization with Catherine Jung, I think it was in 2021, and Behavioral Science in the Wild just this year with Nina Mazar, so in 2022. And it's not all, you have just released the second edition of Managing Customer Value, co-authored with Sarah, so that's it, Marandi, which will be at the heart of our conversation today. So I am very proud and very honored to have you on board, sharing your insight, Dilip. A big thank you for being us, with us uh, today. Thank you, Welcome, Eric. Dilip. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So thank you so very much for inviting me. First of all, uh, a big uh, thank you. Uh, we are very honored and it is great to have you uh, with us today, uh, Dilip. And first of all, um, we all know that uh, behavioral science can be applied for a lot of topics and in many directions. From the beginning of the Human Advantage Conference, we've seen the power of behavioral science to promote and improve sustainability, employee engagement, diversity and inclusion, and also innovation. So Dilip, personally, what, why do you think the behavioral science perspective is specifically helpful regarding the customer value and experience? Uh, gr great question. Let me begin by giving some sort of personal historical context. So I, I'm not a behavioral scientist first. I'm a marketing person first. So I finished my engineering degree, started working on the shop floor. Uh, and then I saw an ad on the shop floor for a job uh, doing sales and service for earth moving machines. So I applied for that. Uh, I still many, many years later have no idea why they picked me. Uh, but that sales job was my first foray into marketing. I spent a little bit of time in advertising after that. And so when I came into behavioral science, sort of the big ideas, the big questions I had were really customer 
value type of questions. Uh, and I do also want to pick up on something Eric said earlier in terms of when he introduced me, he talked about the fact that I'm interested in consumer welfare more than anything else. Uh, and one of my own personal dissatisfactions with the field uh, when, you know, back uh, in, the, in the 1980s and 1990s when I was sort of in sales and, and advertising was it was a very transaction-oriented field. It was about trying to get people to I don't know, buy things they didn't perhaps need, right? And, and so, and everybody talked about value, but there was no good conceptual definition. So that's just by way of background, sort of the way I think about applying behavioral science uh, to the field of customer value, customer experience. So uh, to, to answer the question in terms of how does it actually apply, well, I'll say a couple of things. So I think one of the things that I definitely think behavioral science lets us do is to better understand what drives customer value. And in the absence of that, we, we're always going to rely on sort of our mental models. Uh, we also know from behavioral science that our mental models are usually not typical of, uh, of our customers. We, we, we know there's an empathy gap. We know that as people become more senior, they tend to lose touch with what's happening on the ground. So quick example, uh, suppose I went to a bunch of managers who are in the transportation business and I said, look, let's think about um, a train service. Let's say it's an European train service. It's an overnight train. Uh, if I give people the option between a train journey that takes five hours uh, and costs X euros versus a train journey that costs eight hours, and costs a higher amount, which one would they prefer, right? And, and most people would laugh at me and said, that's a ridiculous question. I mean, obviously people will take the cheaper and faster one, right? It turns out that's not the case. Uh, and it's not the case because uh, people want to sleep on this train, right? So a five hour train doesn't give you enough time to sleep. So especially if you're traveling on business, I mean, you don't want to sleep for four hours and then get up wherever your destination is. So I think those are the kinds of insights that, really understanding the, the behavioral science, I think, uh, lets us do. I mean, we can think about uh, the importance of pricing, the importance of delays. I mean, a lot of people will talk about waiting time as a negative. I always see that as an opportunity. Uh, so, you know, uh, Eric is probably familiar with some work we did early on with the province of Ontario on organ donations. We catch people when they're waiting to renew their driver's license. That's when they have bandwidth. So I think we, we really need to think about sort of, you know, taking those pre-established, preconceived notions of what value is. And I think behavioral science lets us do that. So that's one. I think behavioral science also lets us rethink things that we've been doing repetitively without much thought over the past several years. And I'll give you a classic example of segmentation, right? This is the first thing we teach people segmentation. Uh, and so I have a, a article coming out with a, with a student, uh, Kellen Kwan, where we make the point that segmentation relies on the idea that people are different from each other. And we know that, right? But we also know from behavioral science that not only are people different from each other, they're also different from themselves, Right. So Dilip on the weekend does things very differently from Dilip on a weekday or in the summer versus the winter or sunny day. We, we know this. Right. Uh, and so why do we end up treating everybody that belongs to one cluster of people similarly when, in fact, there could be some variation within that? And so we call for sort of a, a new way of so essentially rethinking segmentation, uh, make it behaviorally based uh, as opposed to just kind of classifying people, classify behavior. So those, those are two examples that, that sort of highlight the way I think about behavioral science changing uh, how we do the, the, the value, uh, customer value function. I think there's, there's a couple of things. One is I think the methods of behavioral science are really important for us. Like we can learn a lot from what the behavioral scientists do to study situations to help us better understand what value we create for customers. Uh, and then second, uh, the, the insights from the science are helpful. Uh, I always keep saying there are good hypotheses, good starting points that we should test further. But there's just so many insights from the science that we can apply to, uh, to understanding what creates value. So uh, perhaps a long answer to your short question, but that's the way I think about it. No, 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 no not at all. Thank you very much. And it makes really sense. And also, the fact that you, you repeat and re, re, re put at the, at the center the question of the of the of the context and, and the moment and everything which is, which is li linked to to this. Um, um, 
Another question, uh, Dilip. As Eric has mentioned, you have just released the second edition of your book, Managing Customer Value. Why have you decided to write a totally new edition? And what have you learned from the last 10 years which has convinced you to do so? Ah, that, that's an easier question. Uh, so I, I will say that the first edition of the book came out in 2009. It was written in 2008. So we, as you can imagine, we started working on it late 2007. So if I just do a snapshot of late 2007 to now, iPhone had just been introduced back then. Uh, tablets, uh, the, only, the only tablet we knew back then were the things that medicine comes in. Uh, we didn't have tablet computers. We didn't, like Netflix was still sending out like, you know, discs by mail at that point in time. Uh, we had never heard of the gig economy. Uh, so clearly the world had changed. And, and so you could sort of look at sort of these very visual indicators. But I think there were three, three other big things that are drivers for, I think, the way we have changed the way in which we do customer value functions. So obviously digital and social Uh, was huge. Uh, again, back then there was hardly anything. Again, Twitter had just been launched. Uh, and so we hadn't learned about the power of social media. We hadn't learned about the role that communities could play. Um, influencers were still uh, in the physical world. And essentially it was all about just getting an endorsement as opposed to an influence. So, so I think that, that's changed the way we think about going to market uh, for sure. Behavioral science. I mean, you know, the first edition of Nudge had not come out when we started working on this book, right? And so now we have a long literature in that field. People understand behavior change a lot better. We have a vocabulary. Um, and it, all of that was missing in the first uh, edition of the book. I mean, we, uh, we, we are, I, I don't think the word nudge showed up uh, in the first edition of the book, right? So, so that. Uh, and, and then the, the data and machine learning, right? So one of the things going back to the point I made earlier about segmentation, uh, machine learning now lets us create segments that are unique to a particular purchasing occasion, a particular transaction, right? And we couldn't do that. So I think th this article that I spoke about on segmentation couldn't have even been written 15 years ago uh, because it's all very fine to say, well, let's, let's base it on real segments, let's base it on real behavior, but we couldn't. And I think now we can. So I think capabilities have changed immensely. Uh, the marketplace has become a lot more crowded and, uh, you know, I, back in the days when thinking about financial services, like insurance companies just sold insurance products and banks just had accounts and now everybody does everything. So I think, you know, with, with all of that going on as well, it's created a lot more potential for confusion, but at the same time, potential for businesses to better understand how they can create value. So it's a completely, uh, completely different game. And I think it was really sort of at some point in time, uh, you know, reading the old version of the book uh, and say, well, hang on, none of this is actually the, the world right now. And I think both Sarah and I kept pushing it back. And then the pandemic happened and we were all sitting at home for a period of time. And I picked up the phone and I said to Sarah, well, why don't we, why don't we redo this? And initially we thought it'd just be like a question of updating some chapters. And then very quickly we realized we just had to rewrite the whole thing. So that's how that came about. But yeah, as you can see, it's a completely different world. In, in, in a short 12 or 13 years. Thank you. Um, what um, perhaps remains uh, uh, an important topic on, on, your, on a point of view and a personal point of view is the fact that uh, an organization should hold the individual, individual's hand and walk them through a value chain one stage at a time. Can, can you explain this a bit more? And more generally, what are the key insights from your book about the best way to manage customer value? Okay, so I, I think now, now you're getting into the heart of sort of the way we think about the problem. So I'm going to hold up the book again. On, on the cover, you see ladders and people climbing ladders. Uh, and we use the ladder as a metaphor for how to grow customer value. Uh, over time. So you, you never climb a ladder by jumping from the bottom to the top. You go it one step at a time. And I think that's the point we're trying to make. Uh, and that essentially means when we think about any customer activity, any customer outputs that we have in mind, is I think we have to be very deliberate about the pathway 
the customer should take to get to that point. And not everybody should get to the same stage in the ladder, right? Some people, it doesn't make sense to go to the top. And, and so that's why I keep pushing for the welfare idea. For, for some customers, it may make no sense to be your most loyal customer for whatever reason, right? And so I think we need to develop a way in which we can figure. But so, so the ladder becomes sort of a, an interesting metaphor. Um, to, to operationalize the ladder, we think about customer activity and the notion of decomposing all of our metrics, including revenue. Uh, you've probably experienced this, but we've often worked with uh, businesses that will kind of say, uh, oh, you know, revenues dropped or benchmark with competition or revenue hasn't grown. Uh, and we try to understand why that's the case. And we're appalled at the fact that a lot of these businesses don't maintain uh, the data on basic drivers of revenue. So if I apply, for example, a metaphor of a retailer, what does a retailer do? I remember this conference where there was a CEO of a, of a retailer uh, who was speaking and he said something like, you know, re retailing is really simple, right? Uh, and everybody was like, wow, like, that can't be true. He says, oh, it's just four things. You bring people to your store, step one. Uh, once they're there, you get them to buy something, step two. Uh, step three, once they bought something, get them to buy something else. Uh, and then step four, have them come back again and again and do the same thing, right? So that, that, that kind of stayed with me in an interesting sort of way, which is, I said, well, okay, if revenues are declining, if we had data on each of these four components, we'd know what the problem is, right? So two firms with declining revenues, one might just be a traffic problem. People aren't coming to the store as much. The other one might just be a conversion rate problem, right? And so... Uh, Again, having that fine-grained metric in terms of what's working and what's not, I think allows you to then construct the ladder because for every step in the ladder, then there's a metric, right? Is you can say, well, look, people are just not climbing the ladder to begin with. That's a traffic problem or they're not going to the first step. That's the conversion rate problem or they're not climbing fast enough, right? Uh, so I think that's one pillar uh, that underlies sort of the way we think about customer value. The other pillar is something I've spoken about a lot also in some of my other work on behavioral science, the notion of heterogeneity, right? No two customers are alike. We just spoke about that, but uh, we, we need to respect multiple paths, right? So the optimal ladder for Eric is going to be different from an optimal ladder for Dilip, different from an optimal ladder for Stefan. And I think we need to, we need to acknowledge that. We need to customize the way we, uh, we design interventions. Uh, so think about the following simple thought experiment. It's, at this point in time, it's a thought experiment, but it's not too far from being reality, which is, let's imagine, I, like I know that different people like different layouts of a website, okay? So Eric likes something, uh, to be organized by attribute, perhaps, Stefan, you like something to be organized by options. Um, but of course, as a web designer, I have to choose one or the other. What if, what if I could somehow quickly figure out whether the customer that's arriving at my website right now is like Eric or like Stefan, right? And if it is like Eric, I can then serve them a by attribute website. If it is like Stefan, I can serve them. Right? Now, so I keep saying this is this is a thought experiment, but it's actually potentially doable. If I can come up with quick ways of figuring out what are those observable features of Eric's behavior uh, that define his or her preference for the kind of website, I can actually start customizing those interventions. So things like that, uh, I, I think we need to, uh, you know, we need to be able to do and we can do now with all of the new tools uh, at our disposal. And then finally, the notion of just being able to actively, clearly conceptualize what we mean by value and how to measure it. Uh, I don't know about you, but I found value as like a big error term. Like everybody throws it around. Um, you know, why, why do we do this if we don't have any other explanations or because it builds customer value, right? And then you ask people, what does that actually mean? And they don't have a good answer, right? So in the book, we, we make distinction between different kinds of values, right? So economic versus experiential. Right? Economic value is something you can quantify a priori. Uh, I have a faster machine than my incumbent. I can quantify what that means for my customer. Right? Uh, I have a slower train ride. That's an experience. It changes the way, it changes the nature of the day I have afterwards. Eventually, it will convert to economic value because as people learn, that the slower train makes for a better holiday or for a better working day the next day, they'll be willing to pay more. Uh, but right now, it's it's the experience and not the economics. So you can think about that dimension. You could think about where the value manifests itself, right? So think about 
think about like a faster machine, right? Who's going to make the decision to purchase the purchasing manager? Uh, but the purchasing manager probably never sees the value. It's the person on the shop floor who sees the value uh, when they need less labor or less materials or whatever that might be. Right? So we think about that as, as, as a different type of value than value that is actually consistent or embedded in the consumption experience. So I think we need to be able to put a better framework on just try to understand what we mean by value. How can behavioral science help us understand what that driver of value is? And then how can we measure that? And I think that's, to me, those three are the pillars. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff I could go into. Uh, but again, the notion of the ladder, uh, the notion of heterogeneity, you know, uh, creating customized experiences, and then the ability to conceptualize and measure value, I think, are the three big pillars to answer your question. Yeah, thank you. you you've already, um, you, you gave us some great example, and, and I think it, it, they will make a lot of sense for our audience. But is there some other example uh, that you could uh, share with us uh, to illustrate how to successfully we can manage uh, the client value and experience? Sure. So, so I think, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of stories. Um, they, they are devoid of uh, company names for obvious reasons, uh, but, but I think they'll drive the point home. So, so let's imagine, uh, let's start off with sort of the, the notion of, uh, the you know decomposing metrics and trying to move people up the value ladder. So let's imagine you have an ice cream vendor. In fact, that's a that's an illustration in the book. Uh, and the ice cream vendor has three dimensions on which they could sort of earn revenue from their customers. There's the frequency, how often the person comes to get ice cream. There's the flavor. There are some high margin flavors, some low margin flavors, and then the volume, like. Do they buy one scoop or two scoops or three scoops, right? Uh, and so you can actually almost imagine a cube, okay? At, at, at the bottom left of the cube, you've got somebody who comes very infrequently, buys the cheap stuff or the low margin stuff, uh, and, and only, you know, buys one scoop at a time, right? Now, you can move the person, eventually you want to move them to the top right, where they're buying a lot of scoops very frequently and off the expensive stuff, right? But the question is, what's the right pathway? Right? And, and again, that's where I think, you know, the behavioral science and data science can inform us empirically by testing and figuring out what's the right way. Uh, the right way for Mr. X might be different from the right way for Ms. Y. Uh, but you can then also start doing things like, uh, you know, incentivizing people appropriately. So uh, suppose, suppose we have, you know, Mr. A who comes very frequently and buys like three or four scoops, but he's only buying vanilla right? There's an opportunity. Okay, so we call it opportunity segmentation, right? The opportunity is if only Mr. A bought an expensive flavor, uh, you could earn more revenue from them. Now, again, I'm not about to suggest that we do it if they don't want it, right? And that's why I keep saying it, it all depends on, you know, what, what the optimal step in the ladder is for those people. But I think those are the kinds of things that that a systematic way of thinking through the ladder can help us understand. And then that's where behavioral science can contribute by showing here's the way in which we do research uh, to understand it. Another quick example. Uh, why do people who come to stores, uh, let's say in, in retailing, planning not to buy anything, end up buying things? Well, they end up buying like, not because they, you know, they don't actually have a concrete plan. Uh, but, you know, we need to start mapping out what happens to people in the stores, right? They browse, they stop, they, if it's an apparel store, maybe they touch the clothes. Uh, and you can start, again, constructing a micro pathway as to what's going on at these different stages. Uh, and then finally, uh, an another quick example that I'll give is, uh, is a cruise company trying to attract people that have never gone on cruises before. Now, here's a company that was offering these, like, eight day long uh, cruises, right? And I'm saying, you know, people who have never cruised before, to get them to go on an eight day cruise is a non-starter, right? It's like going from the bottom of the ladder to the top, right? And so we started constructing a ladder, right? Uh, and, and the company started doing interesting things. They would dock the ship in the harbor, but they would just let out the ship for corporate events. So people could just come to the ship or weddings or other events, right? So people, it was just like a question of being familiar with the ship. Right? Once they were on the ship, then they were like, oh, that's interesting, right? Then they introduced a one-day cruise. It was just a thing that goes down the harbor, comes back, maybe you have a nice dinner, right? Uh, 
But that's how you get people used to it. And I think the research uh, allowed the company to think about what those different steps in the ladder were. So I think those are some examples where we can actually take these basic ideas from the book and then start applying the methods of behavioral science to do the research that can then help us understand how and what those steps look like. Thank you. Um, another question which is really important for us and especially for the kind of audience that we have with us around the Human Advantage event and conference is the fact that uh, we've, under we've understood that uh, you also encourage leaders in organizations to think about the customer value function as something to be organized alongside activities that the firm would like the customers to engage in. Could you elaborate on this? Yeah. So I, uh, uh, one of the things that Sarah and I learned that a lot of companies can't be ladder focused or value focused because of constraints set up by the structure. And, and let me give an example of what I mean by that. Right? Uh, suppose, uh, suppose we start looking at how marketing functions and organizations are organized like what what does the org, org chart look like right uh, it'll jump out that most of them are organized by what the marketer does as opposed to what we want the customer to do there's a disconnect between your activity versus the output right so i do copywriting i'm in the copywriting group or you know you might do media or somebody else might do research right uh, so it's your classic you know, we don't see the 360 view. Uh, but suppose we were organized by, we're all responsible for acquisition, uh, acquiring customers, right? Uh, or we're all responsible for, for creating traffic. Right? So we have different groups that actually do that. So some of the companies that I work with are, are you know, employing some sort of a matrix organization. So yeah, you can still have your copywriters and your research people and your pricing people, but let's overlay a matrix in terms of what your primary behavioral outcome responsibility is, right? If you're the acquisition people, you focus on that. Uh, then it's a question of making sure you have the right metrics to, to maximize. Uh, but, but I think, you know, allowing people to see what the outcome of their work is, is going to be is the, uh, an important ingredient, I think, of the, of the value approach. So that's sort of what we were getting to. I think the other, the other quick thing that I'll say is, uh, there is a big difference between what I call the marketing function and the marketing department. Uh, to Sarah and I, anything that creates customer value is the marketing function. So you could be in design uh, and you're doing marketing, or you could be in sales and you're doing marketing, right? Uh, but most companies don't see it that way. It's like, you know, we put a wall between marketing and everything else. And I think uh, j just the way that setup is, is, is it encourages the mentality of marketing waiting for the rest of the company to generate a product and then taking it out to the market, which, you know, again, works for some, but perhaps there's a better way of doing it. Thank you. Um, we at the, um, at the BVA family, uh, uh, we, we see a, a large part of what we do uh, uh, re relating with uh, evaluating and improving the customer experience. We will see some great examples during the upcoming roundtable with amazing organizations such as Lacoste, Le Francais des Jeux, or Citeo. Our approaches are grounded in uh, behavioral science and uh, bolstered particularly by the pick and end rule and the work conducted by the Ship and Dan Heath brothers, which we summarize with the acronym, acronym EPIC, Elevate, Pride, Insights, and Connection. Regarding the customer experience, what is, according to you, the key success? So let, let me build on especially the Chip and Dan uh, acronym that you spoke about rather than, rather than amplify. So I think their stuff is great, right? Uh, but let me just focus on behavioral science for a moment. I think it is really important to think about behavioral science as a lens and not a tool. And I've heard a few people talk about this most recently. Mike Halsworth uh, makes this point as well. Is, is we, we tend to think about behavioral science as offering a solution to problems. Uh, but I do think we need to think about it as, as a way of looking at problems, or in fact, even as a way of looking at non-problems. 
with a view to saying, can this be better? And, and I think that's an important piece just to, to complement everything else you said is that uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not just a tool. It's not just a solution pack. So I think that's one. I think the other thing is to recognize the centrality of situation, of context, of, you know, the heterogeneity. So because context is king in everything that we do, uh, it is a mistake for us to stick to a winning formula all the time, because if the situation has changed, that formula is going to change. And I, therefore, I think the, the ability to collect quick evidence from time to time becomes all the more important. And, and we've seen this in, in COVID, right? I mean, it was a different story when the world was stable. And the same thing worked year after year. Now, that's not the case, right? And so uh, it's kind of like driving uh, driving through a tricky road with just a rear view mirror uh, if all you do is rely on past successes. So I think really the ability to, to quickly detect what's out there and react to it, I think those become key. Uh, so going beyond just the behavioral science, I think just putting in, in, in place the, the uh, ability to collect data, quickly analyze it, and then react, I think, would be the other key thing. Maybe um, a, a last question before I hand back to Eric. What would your advice be for customer experience directors who would like to start applying behavioral science? Oh, uh, so m m maybe I'll keep To keep this at like a, at a high level, I, I, I could give two. I think the first is uh, to recognize that, in my opinion, every customer-related challenge is a behavioral challenge. Every problem is perhaps a behavioral problem, but not all solutions are behavioral, right? So we always want to change people's behavior, but you don't have to do it through psychology. Uh, and as Eric knows, uh, one of my mentors, Richard Taylor, always keeps saying, the only psychology you really need to know is if you want to get people to do something, make it easy or make it fun, right? Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I think we really need to be clear and precise about what behaviors we want to change, but be open to the possibility that the way in which we change it might just be structural. It might not have to do with, with psychology stuff. So I think that's, that's one, I think. Uh, the, the second, I think, is the metaphor that I use in the last mile of thinking about behavior change as almost like a pipeline problem. Uh, how, do I, how do I get water to flow through a pipeline? I need to create a pressure difference across the two ends of the pipeline. Uh, in psychology, that's motivation. Uh, and then I need to keep the pipes clean. Uh, in psychology, that's reducing sludge or... Uh, in, improving nudge. Uh, and sometimes we focus so much on the nudge and not the motivation uh, that we'll clean up the pipes, but water isn't flowing. Well, that's because nobody wants to flow through your pipe. So I think really keeping those two pieces in mind, I think Dan, Dan has a similar metaphor in one of his recent uh, talks as well. But I think keeping that motivation and friction piece as two separate distinct things that we both need to, to manage, I think that's key. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dilip. I was sure this uh, conversation will be uh, very uh, helpful, would be very helpful, and it is uh, the uh, case. So thanks a lot. Maybe a final question about the future. Uh, regarding the challenge of customer value in general and customer experience specifically, why, what do you think the future looks like? anything you are excited or hopeful uh, about? Yeah, so um, I think I'll respond to that as a scientist um, and, and say that I think the thing that really excites me is the promise that new technologies, new data, new analytics allow us. There were, like I say earlier, there were things we, we knew conceptually we had to do differently but couldn't because we couldn't observe it. And now we can. Right. So I think just like the, the excitement I sense is, you know, being able to take tools like machine learning and then use them to help us better understand uh, behaviors and fix them. We also used to emphasize, I remember the early days of applied behavioral science, that RCTs are central. If you don't have an RCT, it's not really science. I think that's changing now. I think like with some of these new tools, there's, there's things that we can do perhaps better than RCTs. So, but I think that's the excitement to me is, is we can get quicker data, faster data, actionable data sooner. So uh, thanks again uh, a lot, uh, Dilip. It has been a real 
pleasure to have you at the Human uh, Advantage uh, Conference. Uh, and we are looking uh, to speaking with you again uh, later for a specific session. I will be part of this session with you for the Infusing Behavioral Science uh, within organization, which is, I think, one of your uh, key topic and uh, area of interest. So thanks again. Thank you both. Thank you so very much. A last, a last point to our uh, dear participants. Uh, dear participants, stay tuned and log in because we have a huge array of speakers and roundtables coming up to showcase real life application of behavioral science that generates actual impact. We'll see you soon. So as Eric mentioned, you'll see more of Delip this afternoon in a round table with, with Eric and myself and some others. Now. Yes, now uh, we are more than excited to welcome uh, some great speaker for a round table dedicated to uh, customer experience. So I uh, invite uh, our guest to join this uh, round table, Elodie Dorfiak, Marketing Director at Citeo. Sophie Le Fur Dupuy, Head of Customer Insight and Client Experience at Française des Jeux, and Jennifer Luchet, Brand uh, and Shopper Manager at Lacoste. So, uh, so welcome to you and Stéphane. So this conversation will be moderated by Stéphane Marcel, who you just met in the interview with, with Dilip Soman. And this conversation will take place in French, but of course you have simultaneous translation in English if you're watching online. And we'll see you after the break. Stéphane, after you. Merci. Thank you. Uh, bonjour à toutes et tous. Uh, well, good morning. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are, Asia, Europe, hopefully uh, a bit later from the US as well. Ladies, uh, welcome to all three of you. This morning, we're going to talk about customer experience and more precisely, how we can build epic client experience. What I like about this roundtable is that hopefully we can actually get a better grasp of what we can do, uh, how we can, what is actionable along the value chain in terms of customer experience, uh, experience design, and uh, experience implementation. As I mentioned earlier, we talked about the EPIC framework. Uh, EPIC is a concept with uh, imported, inspired by two Americans. Here is the book, uh, The Power of Moment. In French, c'est le moment qui compte. They laid the fundamentals of the EPIC framework, which is the framework we used when we worked with uh, the, the three companies that are represented in this roundtable, and we're going to tell you about their stories during the roundtable. So let's get started without further ado. Elodie, turning to you with a first uh, simple question. Um, tell us about the, the context. How did you decide and why did you decide to um, engage in EPIC? And maybe you also want to briefly introduce CTO. Uh, many people outside of France may not know you. Yes. Good morning. I'm Elodie Dorfiak, Head of uh, Marketing at CTO. CTO is the former Eco Emballage, Eco Folio company. We are an eco company, a private organization with a public public support. We manage and, and, and operate um, uh, waste sorting in France. Um, and since 2017, CTO has gone through a major cultural revolution. Our company has radically changed. We went um, uh, from being uh, a company um, which was very historical, where people were paying what they consider to be a tax, a tax on uh, paper waste. In 2017, we lost a monopoly and uh, because we, the market became competitive and that's when we completely changed because we had to. We became a service provider to manage uh, paper waste. And of, obviously, when you're a private company, customer loyalty becomes essential. So this is when we started to measure customer satisfaction, 
uh, we learned how to track customer satisfaction, and we worked with decided to work with BVA to actually monitor customer satisfaction. And over the past two years, we decided to change the questionnaire we send to our customers, and we introduced Epic. Epic as a tool to take new, much more emotional questions. Epic, E-P-I-C, you may or may not have said it, is Elevation, Pride, Insight, and Connection. Uh, so the question is, are customers surprised? How unique did customers feel? feel how, how curious are they? And do they feel they have... Um, a lasting, sustainable relationship. So, and how much do they memorize about this? So, it is much more about emotions and how people feel. So, we've added some epic questions in addition to standard questions about customer satisfaction, uh, net promoter score, and so on and so on. And um, We've also tried to see if some of these drivers were connected. And, um, for example, the question is, have you had uh, some sort of emotional peak during your customer interaction with CTO? And, and if yes, it has a huge impact on uh, customer um, experience and how um, people rate customer experience. So I have some number. Elevation is the most impactful driver at CTO. For half the customers who answer positively when they say CTO surprises me in a positive way because I get better support than what I normally get. You go from 7.5 to 8.1 uh, on a total of 10. The net promoter score, uh, if the customer has no epic, it, you know, it's plus six. And customers who feel very surprised, NPS goes to 38, plus 38. So this shows that it works. Well, if you say so. Um, so what you are describing and demonstrating that this is a framework which is very much uh, influenced uh, and implemented by behavioral sciences. We've been talking about behavioral science since yesterday. It makes a difference from the very beginning of uh, the value chain. Uh, we're going to go a bit further and see how it, um, what the outcomes have been to date. Uh, Sophie, turning to you, you've also also used EPIC, but you've gone further when it comes to customer experience uh, at the La Française des Jeux. You have gone much further, uh, and, and, and you're going to tell us uh, what you've done exactly and, and tell us that you've gone much further indeed when it comes to um, uh, EPIC, and you've discovered that you can do so much to bridge um, gaps. There is one gap that we um, are very interested in, in, in your experience, which is the gap that Philip Soman uh, mentioned, the so-called empathy gap, which is very visible in companies that are push companies. Empathy uh, means being customer-centric. Tell us about your experience. Tell us what, uh, what you've done and how it has served you. Well, thank you, Stefan, for your introduction. Um, a few words about La Française des Jeux. Um, you may not know us if you're abroad. Um, we are the leading gambling company in France, lottery company. We have 26 million customers in France, one in two. Uh, citizens, um, roughly. Uh, we are distributed uh, either digitally um, and we have points of sale, uh, tobacco stores, um, newspaper stores, and so on. And so we have a very, uh, we have 33,000 points of sale in 11,000 cities across the country. Uh, and the, the network is very heterogeneous. Uh, small cities, uh, large cities, train stations, areas of transit, um, very heterogeneous. And 
So are our customers. We don't know our customers. We have no customer data. We cannot identify our customers. We don't have a loyalty scheme, which means that we are virtually blind when it comes to our customers. Um, we want to be more customer-centric. We want to have a relationship which generates value. For our, and, and to do this, we need to know our customers. So we reached out to BVA to actually reach out and better get to know our shoppers. So to answer your question, what did we do? We had three objectives. First of all, customer profiling, understand their customer journey, and then measure, evaluate their customer experience. So we did a shopper survey, um, a, a massive survey, with different types of methodologies influenced by behavioral sciences. The first one was to, uh, with BVA, we had surveyors going that, uh, that went to 80 points of sale to actually understand the purchasing experience. We had passive uh, measurements, um, including eye tracking. So we uh, shoppers went uh, were equipped with uh, eye tracking glasses to see how they visually um, process information. What do people see? What do people look at? And what do people remember when they leave the point of sale? How visible, how readable is the information? and is all the information that is displayed relevant. For customers, uh, those who do play or gamble, some were equipped with bracelets that measure their emotion. The bottom line was to find out whether we were offering an experience, an emotional experience, and if yes, when and how. And last, but not least, we built in the EPIC model in our questions to find out if there were any positive experiences and what induces these um, positive moments. Okay, very interesting, uh, very comprehensive. Um, I think that this clearly allows you to show that you can you can observe behaviors and, as you said, bridge some gaps, especially when it comes to emotions. You can measure emotions uh, in a verbal way, but you could also measure a lot more by equipping people with this bracelet. Um, let's turn to, you know, Lacoste. I love the sweater, by the way. Uh, Lacoste, I, I don't think I need to introduce Lacoste unless you want to do it. Well, I think it's always important to introduce the company you work for. I'm for Lacoste. I have a husky voice that I apologize. Lacoste is a worldwide known company for its polos. Uh, we're delighted we're celebrating our 19, 90th anniversary uh, very, very soon. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So let's once again talk about behavioral sciences, but in a different context. We talked about the value chain earlier. We're now going to talk about designing the experience. We've talked about measuring, but with you, we're going to talk about designing the experience. So before you tell us how you've used behavioral sciences and what you've done exactly with behavioral sciences, I think it would make sense for um, uh, our listeners to understand the context. What were the challenges? What was the problem to be solved? Well, I think the question of whether we were going to use behavioral sciences occurred to us overnight. Um, we, we, we went through this process step by step. I think you need to know yourself as a brand. You need to know what your mission is as a brand and what your objectives are as a brand. And then when you, when you work on your customer experience or your target customer experience, it is based on all that information. So at that point, we decided to uh, take behavioral sciences on board. Uh, our ambition was to reveal the emotional potential of our customer journey. Uh, we, in other words, make our customers dream when they enter a point of sale. Lacoste operates on, on, on more than 100 markets, 1,200 points of sale, and um, 
we have different cultures. We operate in different with different customer profiles. So when we talk about emotions, first of all, you need to know yourself as a brand. What kind of emotions do we want to give to our customers? And how do we actually touch customers? So that was point two. How do you address customer expectations in different specific markets? Okay, now let's talk about the project specifically now, the project we, BVA, worked on with you. Um, the design phase is the most important one because we created a very unique experience. But you are in retail, uh, in premium retail. We worked on the um, sales or transaction ceremony. Could you tell us about Epic and how Epic was used as a creative driver? Yes. Once again, all this did not happen overnight. The first thing we did is was to define uh, our customer journey. What do we want our customer to be? Customer journey to be. Then, what are must-haves? What are the mandatory things we want our customers to experience when they shop Lacoste? Behind that, what is our philosophy? There again, we had to define our philosophy. What do we want? What do we not want? And what do we want to do? And what do we not want to do? And then we have to define important moments. We call them the signature moments. And that's where Epic comes in. We want to generate emotions. We want to generate surprise, pride, and other emotions that can be generated with Epic. So we identified each moment and, uh, to see what moment could be differentiating, different from any of the other moments in the ceremony, and how we also compare ourselves to the competition. When you sell um, a Lacoste polo, um, you're not selling another polo. We are a very unique brand. The question was, how so? We are addressing many customers in many countries, in many geographies and cultures, so it has to be meaningful in the US, China, Europe. This is again where BVA was very instrumental to make sure that as a brand we were consistent, consistent in different cultures and in line with our DNA in different cultures. And um, this was very helpful. Okay. Um, very much in line with what we said yesterday and again with what Philip said this morning when he talked about segmentation and customization or personalization. When you design your customer journey or customer experience, um, you have many points of sale. Obviously, one challenge is to make sure that brand, first of all, you have to design your experience, but then how do you make sure that people actually own the experience and, and experience the experience the way you want them to experience it? How do you ensure this? Um, you are very much into uh, rituals. Uh, I guess we're now in step three. We talked about measure design. We're now in the implementation phase. How did you successfully implement? And how do you, once again, leverage behavioral sciences to, uh, first of all, allow your salespeople to own this new experience? How do you make sure people actually do what you want them to do? Well, that's truly the critical phase. Again, we're talking to human people, human beings, so it takes time. So what we used here was a framework. First of all, uh, our first audience is trainers. Training and education is, of course, a very important thing for our sales associates all over the world. And we used a nudge technique to keep things simple. And that is clearly what the nudge allows. Um, you don't need to just tell them all the time what they need to do and what they mustn't do. You need to make things accessible to them implicitly. 
So we implicitly communicated our philosophy, our postures, our signature moments. And again today, uh, the nudge is at the heart of our, our education, but also at the point of sale. We're also nudging the POS uh, to have little booster shots all over. To give you an example, what do I mean by nudge? Again, our second objective was to address customer expectations. That's pretty simple. We created a phase which for us Europeans may seem uh, pretty conventional, uh, but internationally it's not that obvious. We have an observation phase. That is something that the luxury sector uh, has been using for a long time. Uh, we were in the premium segment and we were less in that mindset. Usually you, you, uh, it's a sellout that's the most important thing, but now we really have an important uh, aspect there because we really want the shopping experience to be memorable. They're not going to remember what we told them, but what they felt. Uh, so typically, uh, that's the nudge, a couple of uh, points, a couple of letters that they need to remember, and it works in every more in every market. And then each market, of course, needs to embrace these principles and reveal it to the customer with all of uh, the uh, language and cultural aspects. Thanks for the enlightening example. Uh, let's return to Française des Jeux with you, uh, Sophie. The manner in which you can capture the customer voice is great, but it needs to be useful. So, a simple question. What are the key learnings from this? And in a sense, what do you think you would not have discovered? in terms of benefits, and it also allows you to see things differently on how you can measure an experience or, or conduct customer satisfaction surveys? Sure, I'll tell you. Well, key learnings, 80 points of sale, 1,600 shoppers. It would take hours to explain the whole process, but basically, four major benefits of the project. Uh, the first one was really to retrieve knowledge and circulate it throughout the company. Uh, there's a true dissonance between what people conceptualize at head office and what actually happens in the point of sale. And it was really important for us to uh, circulate that knowledge more broadly to get rid of preconceptions. For instance, there's this urban legend that says that scratch, uh, scratch cards are impulse purchases, but in fact they're not. So robustness of the system, uh, a big quantitative survey, uh, quantitative data that's undisputable, but then a more passive measures such as a video of eye tracking, you show it uh, at the XCOM, and it um, talks uh, lots more than a, a long PowerPoint. Second learning, it might seem obvious, but in fact, the context and the location of the point of sale has a huge impact on uh, shopping behaviors and on the experience. Uh, for instance, uh, if you're in a so-called flow POS, it's three minutes, and if it's somewhere where you sit, it's 25 minutes. So it's absolutely not the same story you can tell, an experience you can create, and that has a huge impact on the uh, uh, the uh, partner shop owner to uh, to fulfil their mission to guide. Uh, the uh, to orient the shopper because we're not alone, of course, in these points of sale. And that was a very interesting point in the survey. Uh, in in very real terms, it allowed us to determine which FDJ elements were still relevant and those that were no longer relevant. Um, in fact, people don't really uh, use uh, the specific furniture to fill in their uh, lottery cards. So it may seem obvious to you at BBA, but a very important thing is measuring satisfaction. And measuring satisfaction does not mean measuring experience. We have uh, customer paths that are satisfactory. Uh, our grade is seven. 
it's pretty easy uh, to buy a scratch card or, or a lottery ticket and uh, shoppers are very happy with the uh, functional aspects. But in terms of actual FDJ experience at the point of sale, very clearly things can be optimized and those are methodologies that are more behavioral uh, with an emotional approach. Thanks. Elodie, you were telling us that you use that framework as part of the uh, revamping of your experience measurement system and how the fact that you integrated emotional measures, which, which also sounds very obvious for people in this room, but isn't necessarily for everyone, uh, had uh, breathed new life into the system and maybe led you to think differently about your marketing, uh, particularly on issues that are as important as the customer path. Could you say more? I think Sophie really explained it very well. When measuring satisfaction, you you measure the most. Uh, you you measure the irritants, the, um, the how the expectations are fulfilled. But if you drill down, uh, you find a whole new playing field uh, for the brands and for for the marketing team. Uh, at Citeo, we have invested significantly on the digital path. A lot of our B2B uh, relationships are conducted online. And therefore, we really worked on customer feelings as they make progress along that path. So we analyze the interactions, we analyze the experience, uh, user experience improvement, service contents. What do we do now that we didn't do before? And I think Epic triggered that. We have a lot of test users, instant, instantaneous test users. We have uh, real-time observation tools. Uh, how long, uh, how long was the mouse on such or such a place, and so on. So there are new methodologies to try and identify the experience and value for clients, for customers. We have, of course, the personas, and. Uh, uh, we have a different actions for each persona. So these are really new practices uh, for all of our uh, product managers. And we also use these learnings in the design of our emails, our tone of voice. We're a tech business. We're all engineers. But now we have radically changed the manner in which we talk to our customers to fuel surprise, connivance, proximity, all of these positive emotions where we, uh, we're just tech-based engineers. Very clear, thanks. Back to you, Sophie. So research, learnings, visible impact to fuel a project, a deeper project. Can you tell us where you're at? Well, the project is uh, uh, is still in its early stages because there's a lot to be done. So we presented the uh, profile to the XCOM, the results of the survey, with the retail experience team, who based on the results uh, drew up an action plan. So I won't tell you everything that we're going to be doing, but basically we're going to be working on revamping the customer experience based on the context and location of the point of sale. And we're also going to be taking into account the entire purchasing sequence. What do you say at what moment? Uh, how do you make sure you don't arrive too late um, in, in the uh, customer path to make sure that it's not entirely automated? And then we also thought about how our partner retailers can work with us. Their role can be optimized. The context uh, needs to be improved. We need to help them to create experiences that can generate emotion. Uh, and that's one of the learnings of the EPIC model. How can you work on pride and connection in support of our uh, retail partners? Thank you. So time flies with you. Uh, we only have three minutes or so left, but I would like each of you to take a minute to perhaps open up and uh, uh, tell us uh, what 
beyond your own projects, behavioral sciences have, uh, have uh, brought to you. And you, Sophie, for instance, uh, as part of your insight job, uh, insights and behavioral sciences, what does it mean to you? Well, I'm I'm a an old I'm a veteran of uh, customer research now, but I'd say that when you've been studying customers and shoppers, behavioral sciences are an absolute must. What it's brought me was uh, the fact that it's allowed me to bring my bosses relevant insights, and I believe that when you work on people's behaviors. And when you have projections, if you only work on what people say, uh, you make the wrong decisions. And it's all the more important, especially for me, uh, I work in gambling. So we have a gambling or gaming experience and hopefully uh, winning. Uh, and we also need to work on uh, aspects of addiction. So behavioral uh, science is, uh, is really necessary. Jennifer, same question. You're not quite in the same sector for your job, for the manner in which you work and so on, what has behavioral sciences contributed? Well, it actually completely uh, turned our corporate culture upside down. Uh, we very much worked in silos, but now we really have a 360 degree approach where marketing and HR and retail uh, all work together. Uh, for customer satisfaction in store. Super. Eh bien, Elodie, la même question. On peut, on peut l'élargir parce qu'on peut parler de la customer experience ou du marketing. So, of course, we can talk about the customer experience or marketing in general. What, um, I mean, the job, the inspiration uh, for those who are listening. Okay, great. I only have 26 seconds. Too bad. That will be uh, time less for Q&A. I think one of the big challenges is customer loyalty. Uh, generating emotions creates attachment. If you manage irritants and manage uh, that is not sufficient to engage customers in a sustainable relationship, uh, we have just in entered now a competitive marketplace, so we need to compete and uh, obtain loyalty. Our customer relations team have understood that emotions were powerful in uh, attachment to the brand. And another aspect that I haven't talked about yet is the mobilization of customers as citizens. I talked about B2B, but I didn't talk about citizens who sort their waste. Today, um, there are more people who sort their waste than vote, but there's only one in two uh, French citizens who sort their waste all the time and everywhere. And that's really essential to go and find these new waste sorters in cities, uh, in young people, uh, in uh, e-commerce, uh, in, uh, in and to, to try and develop reuse and recycling to limit. Uh, are the impact of our consumption on the planet. And the nudge experience that Jennifer was talking about is also very important. And it's as important about giving instructions about how to sort properly. So I hope that tonight, when you're in a kitchen sorting your waste, you'll think of me. Thanks for the uh, stimulation uh, for us to be good citizens and for sharing that experience with us. So, only just a little minute uh, taken off, uh, shaved off the uh, Q&A session, but let's start with a question. In the room, you should be handed a mic. My question is for Mrs. Le Fur. Of course, we're, we're all aware that one of the key drivers of, uh, of the, the lotteries are cognitive biases and so on. Uh, one of the biases is, uh, is excess confidence, although the probabilities are low. That is one of the drivers. And my question is an ethical question. Uh, to what extent do you use the cognitive bias through the customer experience 
to both encourage gamblers to gamble, to bet their money with uh, a probability that they're going to win big uh, being very low, while also limiting addiction. That's a huge question. The probability um, that you can win uh, a low, but they exist. So there is a millionaire every two days or so, so you can always be hopeful. Uh, people play within a very specific framework. We have a lot of prevention messages and we also nudge in terms of uh, prevention. We do that for Amigo. And we are there to channel gambling to make sure that they work uh, in a context uh, which is a context of recreation, uh, including when they are gambling on sports, when they're sports betting, uh, and that it remains fun rather than problematic. And the other challenge is to try to retain them on a legal offering in the face of an illegal offering, which is growing very fast. So, in terms of uh, measuring and the prevention of addiction, uh, it's a big issue we worked with Etienne on that, is that we, in fact, we pilot the profile of our gamblers. There's the Canadian Excess Gambling Index, uh, the evidence is whether people are okay or whether they've lost control. So across all of our pool of players, we conduct, uh, we measure things regularly to see if people are, are still in their comfort zone or if they have a gambling problem. So it's not usually a particular game that generates addiction because problematic gamblers play l plenty of different games. So it's very difficult to know uh, what the behavior is in relation to a particular uh, product, but then we can perhaps reorganize the game. Um, we can uh, we can have uh, the prize draw at, uh, say, at 8 p.m. because problematic players play gamblers gamble later than that, or, or individual uh, systems with uh, outgoing phone calls to try and redirect problematic gamblers towards uh, uh, charities or, or companies that manage uh, addiction. We have a question on the screen there, which we have just debated. What nudge did you use to have an impact on your targets, notably in a context of non-control of the environment where, where, where things are, uh, take place? So, of course, the first step of the work was to use nudge in training for all of our sales force, our sales associates, and then to nudge the store environment. Our key target, I said so as an introduction, Lacoste is uh, globally known for its polo shirts, but also other iconic products. And that is something we need our sales associate to remember, or at least to be aware of, or interested, uh, because through them the customer will be interested. And therefore the questions that customers have, they're going to be asking them to the sales associates. So that's exactly what you do. If you visit a Lacoste point of sale, our new flagship on the Champs-Élysées, for instance, on all of the items that are iconic, apart from the polo shirt, you have uh, POS materials uh, with storytelling um, about these iconic products. So another question on the screen, but I think that was a good answer. What is the time scale for the implementation of projects from the design phase to the implementation phase? One year. Because again, uh, I had a cultural issue there. I had to go out there and scan the entire world. So the knowledge, uh, the data that we needed to gather to fuel uh, BVA's work, uh, that took a whole summer. But then thinking about it, basically three workshops. So within six months, you're there. And then once we defined the design phase, 
uh, the validation approval in the markets took a couple more months. So basically, between the moment when we signed the contract with BVA and the moment when the training sessions were ready, it took one year. Sound a lot of hard work. Indeed. Do we have other questions in the room? Gilles. Better if you use a mic for people who are listening remotely. You were talking about B2B and uh, the competition, which I believe has not yet arrived, uh, and losing market share. What does uh, uh, what, what sort of awareness uh, does CTO have uh, in the target audience? Or how has it changed? So yes, we we do now have a competitor. I won't name them. Uh, they're still really a minority a competitor. We have a huge market share, of course, uh, for our uh, the uh, it's called the responsibility élargie du producteur, the extended producer liability. And the interesting aspect of working with personas is it's a very different relationship with competitors, depending whether you are um, talking about very big uh, companies who are going to be producing millions and millions of uh, items of packaging. They are very well aware of our existence and there, the emotion, the loyalty, all of these emotional drivers are going to be hugely important. And, uh, and the surprise aspect is very, very important for these big customers. Uh, for the little client, the little persona who makes uh, tens of thousands or a few hundred thousands uh, items of packaging, they just want things to run smoothly. And they're going to need other drivers. So it's not so much awareness, uh, brand awareness, than uh, keeping things simple. So we're not going to try to trigger the same emotions. We're not going to use the same levers. I think loyalty will be gained otherwise. And then there's a third persona, which will be these new clients with the extension of uh, the extended uh, responsibility of sellers. That's going to be extended uh, and uh, into uh, e-commerce. That'll be tens of thousands of new customers, notably Chinese customers, uh, who are now are going to be subjected to this uh, extended responsibility. And their market codes are not the same. The level of maturity uh, is not the same at all. So we're going to need to action other emotional drivers, uh, perhaps even more conventional drivers. Thank you, which brings us to the end of this panel discussion. Thanks to all three of you. I hope you found it interesting and inspiring. Uh, many thanks uh, to all of you who have followed this, uh, either on site or online. And for those of you who can use the chat, uh, we're going to send you a little short survey uh, to try and uh, identify your emotions and also uh, send you an invitation to our Human Advantage community. And now over to uh, our hosts for the rest of the day.